So I knocked on a lot of doors mm. and had the door slammed in my face a couple of times. But mm. coming out here also made me more resilient. Like I feel like the rejection therapy was really good for me mm -hmm. because for every person that told me no, I was just like, well, there's another door to knock on. I know that there's somebody here that wants what I got. Welcome back to Full-Time Yoga Teacher Podcast. My name is Reka. I am your host. I hope you are having a great day so far. If you missed last week's episode, last week I interviewed Allison. She is from California, but she left to Southeast Asia to pursue her dream to become an international traveling yoga teacher. Now she calls Laos her home and she still continues to teach yoga in Southeast Asia. If you are interested in becoming a traveling yoga teacher or want to teach yoga in different countries, I would highly recommend last week's episode with Allison. This week, I am so excited to share with you the conversation I had with Amber. Amber is such a powerhouse. She is so strong. She is so confident and she does so much. She has her own business. She teaches different kind of workshops. She does teacher training. She does it all. And I have a huge, huge respect for her. So I am so excited for you to hear her yoga journey, how she became where she is now and what kind of struggles and challenges that she has overcome to be where she is today. Amber is a lifetime athlete long-term yogi and late blooming dancer she has been working in the wellness sphere for 20 plus years with experience in physical therapy athletic training massage therapy and human nutrition she is the founder and director of get lit power yoga and offers teacher trainings both in person and online amber specializes in yoga therapy yoga for athlete women's health, yin yoga, and meditation. She is also certified to teach pole dance and twerk and is passionate about creating safe spaces where people can explore their primal feminine energy and move through their self-limiting beliefs. I hope you'll enjoy the conversation I had with Amber. Let's get started. Welcome, Amber, for coming to join me on the Full-Time Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Rekha. I'm glad to be here. And maybe quickly, can you tell us where are you joining us from? Where do you live? I live in Huntington Beach, California. And is that where you're from? Were you living somewhere else before that? Where are you actually from? I moved to Southern California seven years ago from New Mexico. That's where I spent most of my life. Okay. And how long have you been teaching yoga for? For 11 years. Over a decade, huh? Mm -hmm. And is it something you started teaching after you moved to California or were you already a teacher before you moved to California? I was already teaching before I came to California. And so your 200 hour was in New Mexico? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a program based out of Massachusetts but they were doing the training in New Mexico. Okay. And what kind of sparked your interest to, hey, I think I want to become a yoga teacher? It was actually from my very first practice. I knew oh. that I would teach it. Yeah. What was your first practice? What kind of yoga was it? I picked up a DVD, I think from Target. It was called MTV's real world so-and-so some girl from the real world yoga with her but she wasn't <laughs> even the teacher she was just there for like publicity's sake I guess oh nice and so, when when was that how many years ago was that that was in 2003 so you were practicing on the video for a while and did you start kind of going to studio after that I it took me a while mm, to go to a studio I practiced with the video and then I started going to a studio a little bit. I went to a Bikram studio mm -hmm. and that practice was not for me because the video I had done was vinyasa. And so I really liked that style. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a Bikram class and I wasn't really feeling it. 
Mm -hmm. I tried it a couple more times, but I wasn't a big fan of it. It was too hot for me and it was just the same thing all the time. So I didn't really explore classes much after that because we didn't have much in my Mm -hmm. small town in New Mexico. So Mm -hmm. I just practiced on my own for several years. I kind of dove in deep into it right away from my first class. Like I was really curious about what made this practice so powerful So I was reading the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and um, diving into the eight limbs and really going deep on the philosophy to start with. Wow. So from the get go, and you said from the first class, you had an idea that you you wanted to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started looking into retreats or like teacher trainings. I think at the only time they didn't really have not that I could find any way that worked for me. They didn't have these weekend training things. It was all like go away to Costa Rica for three weeks or something. And I couldn't afford that. So it was just something I had in the back of my mind for years and years. And then the opportunity just kind of landed in my lap. So I took it. Mm. And what kind of format was your 200 hour teacher training that you did? Was it a um, weekend, weekdays, one month long? How long was it? Um, my teacher would come into town for two weekends every month. So we would Mm -hmm. have two weekends on and two weekends off that went on for, I guess, six or seven months. Uh huh. And did you feel you received a good training, good quality training? Was your experience positive? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did like it. Um, I liked that it was spaced out for me. I mean, I already had a history in yoga. I already felt very comfortable with the subject matter Mm -hmm. as well as anatomy and other things. I felt grounded in those things, but I think it was really beneficial for other people, especially to have it spaced out like that versus 13 weekends in a row, because my teacher said that your yoga practice is measured in decades. So it takes like time to integrate this information. Yeah. So true. And from graduating from teacher training, to start teaching your first class like what was that like i was well i started teaching free classes before i uh graduated from the program because i knew that we would have a test coming up Mm -hmm. and i just wanted to be super prepared for it so i started offering classes out of my home Mm -hmm. and i think i did one or two of them and then uh, someone in the community heard that i was doing this and they offered me like warehouse space to do my free class. Mm -hmm. And then that expanded into a regular thing. I turned it into a food drive yoga. Uh So people would bring like two canned goods as Uh their admission class. And eventually the class got so popular that like I had way too much like canned food to carry. Uh (laughs) So I switched it over to donation, but I think the holidays kind of threw it off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, money was not as uh as appealing to people as canned food was <laughs> yeah but how amazing is that that you started before you even graduated to get practice in but then how that grew so much I want to know what were you doing before teacher training what kind of job did you have before I was a waitress and bartender for a long time and were you kind of doing that together during the teacher training and even after the teacher training yes I was bartending I was doing the teacher training and I was going to university at the same time it was a lot yeah what were you studying what was your major uh human nutrition and food science I was planning on being a dietitian but then I went on a retreat uh to help a yoga friend Uh and I he said, why do I want to do dietetics? I think I just want, I just want to be a yoga instructor, do this mm-hmm. all the time. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I want to know uh, your transition of teaching and then working, uh, bartending or working restaurant. Like, How did that slowly transition to becoming more teaching and less of other jobs? So I graduated university in 2013 and I'd already been teaching for a while, but then the the two lifestyles weren't going together, mm-hmm. the bartending and teaching yoga. I learned very early on that those two lifestyles uh, were clashing with each other because when I first started teaching yoga, I would teach whatever people would give me, which was like 5.30 a.m. at a gym or like 8.30 at night. Mm-hmm. And so... It was kind of burning the candle at both ends. Mm-hmm. And then there's the whole 
alcohol situation that comes with the bartending lifestyle. Mm. And so I would wake up in the morning feeling like not my best. Mm. And that is not how I wanted to teach yoga. So Mm. I had to start making moves away from that. And Mm. so I knew that I had gone to massage school in Mm. 2005, but I had never gotten my license. I had just stuck with waiting tables because it was easy. It was fast money. But then when I decided to leave, because I was also just fed up with it, you have Mm. to swallow your pride a lot. It's Mm. just can be like soul crushing work. So when I was ready to leave, I looked into getting my license for Mm -hmm. massage therapy. And luckily, all those years later, I was still able to do it. So that provided a cushion for me. Mm. So then you kind of transition away from the restaurant business and doing massage and yoga at the same time. And Mm -hmm. I want to say that I completely understand you about the restaurant industry. I was in there for quite a long time as well. And I do remember (laughs) saying like, I never, I'm never coming back to this industry, (laughs) you know, because people can be, they can be very rude. And um, yeah, and like you said, the lifestyle not really matching before well not before I was already teaching yoga but I was also very into dancing salsa dancing and bachata and I soon realized those two lifestyles didn't really go well either because people will be out till 3 or 4 a.m dancing and Mm -hmm. it's amazing and it's fun but if you have to wake up in the morning to teach the next day or wearing those dance shoes how like Mm -hmm. it's good for your feet and your whole alignment and I just remember thinking like okay I need to I need to pick (laughs) um Mm -hmm. I ended up picking picking yoga as well but I I still um enjoy dancing here and there when I can and I know you dance as well so I do want to get into that but maybe before um so this was still in New Mexico when you quit the restaurant business started doing massage and teaching Mm -hmm. okay was there enough studios to teach um many classes at the time in New Mexico uh there were three studios if you would count the university and I taught at all three of them. Um, It was a smaller town. So we all kind of knew each other. There was a lot of crossover between studios because I think it didn't take so long to drive anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to pick one or the other. Um, So yeah, I taught at the university just at the athletic center uh, Uh group fitness classes. Uh And then I taught at the two studios. And I would say like for the cost of living in New Mexico, there was enough Mm-hmm. for me to make a living and then the massage therapy helped and i would imagine massage the knowledge of massage will benefit you as a teacher because you get to learn so much about body and anatomy and physiology and like patterns people hold and i feel like as part of yoga teacher all the amazing experience yoga teacher has ability to like see student's body and in a way that maybe a regular person wouldn't see. So I feel like having massage background would really help with that. Yeah, it does for sure. How did that life go to moving to California? So I had been teaching yoga and doing massage out of my house and things were going good. I was invited to teach a workshop here in Sunset Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, A friend of mine was living out here and just wanted me to come teach a class. So I did. And then I was down at the beach and I said, why am I still in New Mexico? Because I'd been wanting to leave for a while. Each just struck me with inspiration. And then the friend that I was visiting said that she would put me up for a couple of months while I got on my feet. So basically the stars aligned for me to move out here. And uh, I didn't have anything really tying me to New Mexico. There were people asking me, so when are you going to open your studio? And I was like, mm No, that's kind of like having a child. It's a really big commitment that I'm not ready for. Mm. So I kind of reached my my ceiling of growth in New Mexico. So that's why I wanted to come and kind of spread my wings. It was hard though, because I had community in New Mexico that Mm. that's where a lot of my income would come from and referrals Mm. and things like that. So I came out to California and I basically had to start all over from scratch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... It's something I think about a lot because I dream of moving somewhere else someday. And I think about, okay, if I move somewhere else, you have to kind of start over. Like nobody knows you in this new place. So you have to really start building your clients, your students, uh, student base again, and maybe even like pay rate, right? Like maybe you used to make this much, but when you move to a new place, they don't know you. So you have to prove yourself. So you might have to start with a lower pay rate. And, and yeah, taking how, the, the less ideal classes. Yes, exactly. So how was that transition like for you? Uh, when I moved out to California, I had to tone my intensity mm-hmm. down a lot 
because mm. I feel like in New Mexico, we're desert people. We are very intense and fiery. And uh, my training was in power yoga. So it always has that like intensity to it. Um, so when I came to California, let's see, I started in Long Beach and I started teaching at the studio that I had done that workshop at. So I had like my foot in the door somewhere at least. Mm. And then I started looking for other opportunities wherever I could find it. And I wasn't really familiar with the geography around here. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure how, I didn't understand how long it took to get places. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching in LA and Hollywood and Santa Monica and Sunset Beach and in all these different places and spreading myself really thin. But it was fun because I had just gotten to California and I was exploring everything, learning about the traffic and learning how to be prepared for being away from home for many hours if you're stuck mm -hmm. on the 405 and things like that. There was a learning curve mm -hmm. to that. But I spent a lot of time on the beach, um, just killing time, waiting for my classes. And, yeah. Um, it was hard because my style when I first got here, I have a lot of different influences. Mm -hmm. And one of the influences was something called booty yoga. Uh huh. And booty yoga is a blend of power yoga, tribal dancing, and plyometrics. So it's really intense and high energy and super fun. and mm -hmm. I think everybody needs to do it. And that's mm -hmm. how I felt when I got here. Mm -hmm. So I was really passionate about introducing people to it, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. A lot of the time it would rub people the wrong way. So it took me a while to figure out how to package my offerings in a way that was palatable to everyone. Well, maybe not everyone, but palatable in general mm -hmm. without compromising my own integrity and like artistic vision. So it's been a long kind of process of finding that. And like I was saying, I was happy to kind of bounce around and go everywhere and show everybody, but that gets exhausting. So I knocked on a lot of doors mm. and had the door slammed in my face a couple of times, but mm. coming out here also made me more resilient. Like I feel like the rejection therapy was really good for me mm -hmm. because for every person that told me no, I was just like, well, there's another door to knock on. I know that there's somebody here that wants what I got. So true. And were you, um, did you stop doing massage the, since you, from the time you moved to California or did, were you still continuing massage? My plan was to continue to do massage, but when I got out here, I didn't have community, which is mm -hmm. an easy thing to kind of rely on. Mm -hmm. I had never worked in like a spa place mm -hmm. like Massage Envy or something because mm -hmm. I've heard that they make you do a lot of massages in a day and mm -hmm. I'm not up for doing that much work. Mm -hmm. I want to do like four massages a week max. So my plan was just to kind of do it on the side. I started like announcing it in classes. By the way, just so you know, I'm a massage therapist. And I felt like I would always get people that came up to me after class that I didn't want to massage. I just, mm. the vibration was yeah. off. And then the carrying of the table. The table is also very bulky and heavy. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm pulling it out of my trunk or putting it into my trunk, I feel like I can hurt my neck really easily. Mm -hmm. The work itself on people's bodies kind of messes my body up a little bit. So it just kind of fell by the wayside. I feel like yoga is a more powerful vehicle for me to help people mm -hmm. because I can, I can help a room full of 30 people at one time versus one person. And when you moved to LA and you started teaching in all the places that you were able to teach, was that enough for you to like, were you able to be like pretty much full time yoga teaching from the get go when you moved to LA? Yes. Um, I feel like I definitely was struggling. I'm trying to remember how did I <laughs> make that work? I think I was just hustling and yeah. really just living very, very modestly. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first got my, I got my first apartment, I think right around three months of being here and it was, like a $900 apartment studio next to a gate that would slam loudly all the time. <laughs> um, I had a just a, a fridge and a microwave. I didn't have a kitchen. And I had to wash my dishes in the bathroom sink. So yeah, I lived like a monk. But <laughs> that's kind of the yogi... I went through the yogi trials with that, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah I just lived very, very modestly. Yes. for a long time I did make it work but uh -huh. it involved a lot of driving oh I can I can relay when I my first my it wasn't even my own place because I had a I was sharing apartment with roommates but with my own yoga yoga teacher income I got the first room and it was the tiniest room and it, it could have been like a closet like it was so tiny I 
uh, what is it? A foldable, like it's like a couch sofa that can become a couch. And at mm-hmm. night I'll pull it out to make it a bed for me to sleep. Cause if mm-hmm. I, if I left it as a bed all day long, like my room b- barely had any space left. So I had to fold mm-hmm. it during the day. Um, and the rent was four seventy five a month. Cause it was so the room was so tiny. <laughs> Where was that? In Long Beach. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. I and I didn't own a car. So I would ride my bicycle everywhere to all the places to teach in Long Beach. Mm. And eventually I moved up to um, having my own scooter and which is what I have now. I have my scooter to get around. Um, but I do, he- I do hear and understand that a lot of teachers in LA, you know, have to drive a lot and teach in so many locations that requires a lot of driving and being tr- stuck in traffic or just killing time between classes because you have this awkward moment of like hour, hour and a half. Um, so, so much, so much respect for you for doing that. At the time that you taught most number of classes, how many classes do you think you were teaching a week? It was pre-pandemic. I was teaching 22 or more classes a week. Yeah. That was the most. And maybe tell us pre-pandemic and during and also post-pandemic, how has your teaching career changed? So pre-pandemic, I was teaching 22 plus classes a week Mm -hmm. and that was rough. I didn't realize how rough it was until the Mm -hmm. pandemic hit. And then I was forced to stop and kind of reevaluate things. And I reflected on how how thin I had been spreading myself. Mm-hmm. There were projects such as teacher training that I had been wanting to do. And I had been hard on myself for not getting those projects going. But then once the pandemic happened and I had all this free time, I realized that I shouldn't have beat myself up because I was just surviving. I didn't have the time to pour into these projects. So... I vowed to myself that I would never go back to that many teaching that many classes a week because it didn't leave any time for me. Um, And then, so during the pandemic, obviously things shifted online. I was teaching the Instagram lives pretty much the day of the shutdown. I was like, people need their yoga still, no matter Mm -hmm. what. So I was doing the Instagram lives and people were sending donations in, which was wonderful. And that helped for a while. And then it kind of petered out and I had to shift Mm -hmm. gears. And then I switched to a Patreon channel, which was somewhat successful for a while. But Mm -hmm. you know, as we've opened things up, it's kind of petered out, but Mm -hmm. it's still active. Um, And then there were the teacher trainings. So I think it started, yeah, I did some teacher trainings. And then I also did like a women's group online. It was kind of like a journey through the chakras and feminine embodiment. So yeah, I just really leaned on my community Mm -hmm. during the pandemic for sure. And then after the pandemic, yeah, just trying to keep my driving circle smaller, like my driving Mm -hmm. radius, being very Mm -hmm. conscious of like, what is a realistic commitment, my my energy levels, like budgeting my energy, budgeting my time, uh, being more firm about boundaries with business. Cause I think being self-employed or, you know, independent contractor, or it's easy to say yes, when you told yourself you were going to say no, Mm -hmm. but then somebody needs help and you're like, Oh, well, I'll just do it this one time. But it kind of, you know, turns into a, it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Like once you kind of lose track of your boundaries, it's easy to lose sight of them for a while and Mm -hmm. then you got to get back on track. So how many classes do you teach now uh, weekly? And I guess um, what's your typical average week of working full-time yoga teacher look like for you now? Uh, So I'm currently teaching about 10 classes, 10 yoga classes a week in the Mm -hmm. studio. And then I have about 10 or more so commitments, but those are personal training. So that means that I don't have to use my body for those as much Mm. and it is way more chill. Um, So that has been a good thing for me. And uh, teacher training, still trying to get that going. It's been kind of tricky as we've been opening up from the pandemic because everybody was kind of getting their bearings at first and now there's inflation. So Mm -hmm. people are not so gung ho to throw a couple thousand dollars at a, at a training as they used to be. Um, marketing is a huge, huge task. And that is actually the reason I've failed to launch this training a couple of times. Mm. I've tried to do a couple trainings in the past couple of years, but just the marketing becomes overwhelming mm-hmm. and it's hard to get enough people to sign up, especially as me, just a free agent. I usually team up with a studio owner mm-hmm. and we, we partner on it. 
But yeah, that hasn't happened in a while because the pandemic still kind of figuring out what is a reasonable ask of people. And so instead of doing a hybrid program, which is what I wanted to do last time, now I'm just going to do completely online. Is that what people are wanting more? I think it's more accessible because... When it came to the hybrid program, everybody's like, oh, I can make these hours, but I can't make those hours. People who are interested in the program are now like giving you input and kind of like influencing you to change the program for Mm -hmm. them. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what they're asking for, Mm -hmm. but as the director of the program, I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should shift it this time or that time. And it just becomes a lot to manage. So if I just have it online, I don't see any reason why people can't commit to that chunk of time. I'm curious about your teacher training. Um, When did you start teaching your teacher training? I started doing teacher trainings. Let's see. I certified in 2012. And I think I started doing teacher trainings in 2015 because my, my small yoga or my New Mexico community, Mm -hmm. they were, they were looking for trainings. Uh And so (laughs) I kind of fulfill that role in most things in my life. I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, somebody else isn't doing it. I guess I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, And with the encouragement of some of my yoga colleagues. Mm -hmm. So I got my yoga school going and I did a 200 hour program partnered with a studio. So Mm -hmm. we uh, split percentage on that. And I did it all by myself. Like it was seven or eight weeks. And I was the only teacher and I will never do that again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I did do it and I did do it two more times, but then <laughs> the, the last time I, I did it, I learned I'm never going to do it again. Like, yeah. Drawing, bringing other people in to uh-huh. take some of the, the workload off. So mm-hmm. I don't have to be on and field all the questions and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also just having their valuable perspective and insights. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it makes it so much better. And so you've been doing teacher training, teaching and organizing and making curriculum for a long time now. Um, Has it evolved over the years? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, I still don't technically have a manual, which Mm -hmm. is a a source of embarrassment for me. Um, I'm not, I am an organized person, but I'm not very, very organized. I tend to kind of procrastinate a little bit and then Mm -hmm. slap things together a bit. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I've relied on on books. I've relied on students kind of taking their notes. And I've almost had them compile their own manual through the homework that they do. But yeah, that's that's my goal this year is to mm-hmm. actually provide a legit manual with mm-hmm. pictures and all the all the bells and whistles. But it evolved uh, through the pandemic. Yeah, going online made made me get a lot more organized. I instead of just kind of having a general concept and winging it, now I've got like actual outlines. So it seems like from the beginning, even you know, first couple of years of your teaching you already had this like business mindset. Like you weren't just like, I'm just a yoga teacher who get employed by a student and just teach. You already had the kind of business mindset of like, I'm, I am my own business and I need to collect email address, have a newsletter, have a website, create my own yoga teacher training. So how did that, how did you develop that from such a like early on in your teaching career? Um, I think my mom just always told me I had to be independent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just made me a go getter in a lot of things. I've never, well, I don't want to say never, but I'm not the type of person who waits around for someone to hand something to me. Like, um, especially when it comes to business. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't ask for it, you're not necessarily going to receive it. So just necessity, really. I knew I didn't want to go back to waiting tables. So this Mm -hmm. is, this is my new path. Better yeah. Do it. Yeah. Do it like I mean it. <laughs> and I I love that about you when I see all the things that you're offering that you have and all the workshop you're leading and trainings. I think it's it's amazing to see that. Cuz if you look around, not all yoga teachers are that way. Some yoga teachers are very content with just working for someone and but maybe like us who kind of had to like, well, like we I had to make a living somehow. Like then there's then there's a more urge to I'm going to make this happen. Or I'm just going to go for it. It's not perfect yet, but I'm just going to go for it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I I highly respect that. <laughs> well, thanks. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard as a single person, right? Because mm-hmm. some some yoga teachers have the luxury of like having a partner or someone else who takes some of the bills. And mm-hmm. Like teaching yoga is just kind of like something fun that they get to do on the side. Whereas you know this is like my bread and butter. I wholeheartedly 
understand that. And that's why I really wanted to do this podcast because there are many quote unquote full, full-time yoga teachers, but there's also a full-time yoga teacher who have assistance from someone else in their family, or maybe had a savings or inheritance or whatever it is. And there are also full-time yoga teachers who's like, this is my, you know, this is me. Like I have to do it or I'm not going to be able to pay rent. I'm not going to be able to have roof over my head next month. So I, I see that you, you put a lot of effort in and you, you work a lot. And I see that you teach a lot of classes and I feel like I understand it because I also have, you know, before pandemic taught 22, but so I think I remember certain couple weeks I taught maybe 28 classes a week. Oh I remember. My God. And oh. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Like, I, that's not sustainable. Okay, so kind of going back to your schedule now, I know you do some personal training and you teach yoga. Do you feel like you found a balance that you feel like it's not draining you? It's not, it's sustainable with the amount of work that you have? I think so. My mm. energy kind of mm, kind of goes up and down. I feel like I, so I'm 42 and I feel like I'm starting to maybe approach a a change in my body Mm. because my energy levels are changing. So now I'm like, okay, now we need to look at how am I going to sustain this business as I can't, as my body will not allow me to teach me so many classes. So the personal training has helped a lot, um, Mm. but that's sales and it's not really like part of it is sales. I just like working with people. I don't like the sales part, Um, Mm. but that helps And I feel like I have pretty much gotten a balance here because I have the luxury of actually having a hobby, Mm -hmm. which is nice. I dance on the side. I Mm -hmm. uh, do pole dancing. and That's just for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I did. I did teach for a little bit, but Mm -hmm. my classes didn't take off. Mm -hmm. So I just decided, no, you know, that's just actually something that I get to do for myself. I don't have to give it to the world. And I think I am getting to a better place because I was still teaching a lot of early mornings. Mm -hmm which um, didn't allow, I mean, being a yoga teacher is kind of solitary Mm. because your schedule is different from everybody else's. Like while they're at work, you could be working, but you sometimes have to make that work for yourself Mm. via like online or person or uh, Mm. private coaching or whatever Mm. it is that you do to fill in those blanks. Because most of our classes happen before noon and after five. So I started to carve out more time for myself, which I think is creating a better balance. Um, instead of doing so many early morning classes, I'm starting to cut those out a bit. So I don't have to wake up so early because sleep is so, so important. When I was in hustler mode, just surviving, I was functioning off of five or six hours of sleep and I felt good. But Then there was a night when I got nine hours of sleep and my whole face changed. I looked like vibrant, alive, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, like (laughs) beauty sleep is a thing. I need to take better (laughs) care of that. And then I've also heard, you know, just the benefits of sleeping seven or eight hours versus sleeping five or six hours are huge. So that's a big priority for me now is sleep and just trying to have a little bit of a social life. And I think I've got kind of a balance. When did you get your personal training, um, is it license or certificate? I'm actually not certified. I got kind of grandfathered in. I was Uh teaching yoga at UFC gym before the pandemic. And then I started up at a different location after the pandemic. I actually, as a yoga teacher, I get paid more. Mm -hmm. than the coaches do for teaching their fitness classes because there's something about yoga that they consider different from Uh the boot camp classes Uh like yoga is more of a specialty so Uh um they invited me Uh to be a coach amazing they probably just saw that I was connected with the members and thought Mm -hmm. oh this girl can make some sales for us (laughs) yeah so they invited me to coach and I have such a long history with body fitness wellness Mm -hmm. all that stuff I think they just trusted Mm-hmm. that I that I can do the job. However, mm-hmm. sometimes I think about getting my personal training license just so I have like a little bit more legitimacy and mm-hmm. also my specialty as a coach or trainer is more mobility and corrective exercise and yoga therapy mm-hmm. whereas other trainers are focused more on like say losing 30 pounds of fat or mm-hmm. putting on 30 pounds of muscle just depending mm-hmm. on the client's goals which mm-hmm. I can help with weight loss. I cannot help with bodybuilding. Mm. My main interest is just helping people feel better in their bodies and whatever activities they like to do, helping them do that better Mm. for a long time. So I'm kind of an exception, which is 
again, a role that I feel like I've done my whole life, <laughs> just <laughs> filling in the holes. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like that's such an inf- important role. I feel like both in yoga and maybe in the fitness world is how can we do it in a way that's sustainable, that we can be doing this for next, you know, whatever, 10, 20, 30 years. So you know, doing it correctly, doing it in a way that's not harmful. Yeah. So I think that's a very important role. And I feel like that is also super important as a yoga teacher too. Has those two role of teaching yoga, a yoga, being a yoga teacher and a personal trainer, has that been, does it translate well? Does it, can, do you use both skill sets in different, in different situations or do you feel like it's does it ever contradict um they complement each other very well Mm -hmm. um for me as a trainer i think the yoga therapy background helps a lot because i understand how to how to um rehabilitate the body Mm -hmm. i also have a background in physical therapy so Mm -hmm. when i'm doing personal training a lot of the time my sessions might look a little bit like physical therapy but they also look like yoga but depending on what the client needs i might have them do weight training instead yeah it really just depends on what the client needs and what i'm very curious when i read your bio about your experience in um physical therapy as well as yoga therapy because i think um, that's something i'm very interested in yeah i was uh 17 when i went to the physical therapy department at my local hospital Mm. i heard that they were doing like an informal internship with Mm. a couple of other high school students Mm -hmm. who were interested in physical therapy Uh and i thought okay this is my opportunity to see how i like this field if this is what i want to go into they brought me in and had me doing physical therapy with nursing home patients uh-huh. unsupervised at one point. Like wow. I didn't have, I didn't have the training for uh-huh. this, but like, you know, I don't know if you know how small towns are. They just sometimes <laughs> don't follow the rules. They yeah. just kind of do whatever they want. Um, so I was doing billing. I was doing physical therapy at 17. Wow. Yeah. And then I think I had a, a patient who, lost control of her bowels on the parallel bars. Uh And I didn't know how to react to that. Uh I mean, I hadn't been trained for that kind of situation. And it still haunts me. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't remember the details, but I just pray that I didn't like make that woman feel worse than she already did. So physical therapy. Yeah. I thought I was going to go into that, but then I, I realized how much people don't do their homework with mm-hmm. physical therapy. Yeah. And that rubs me the wrong way. Um, <laughs> same thing with nutrition. That's re- uh-huh. the reason why I didn't become a dietitian. Uh-huh. One of the reasons mm-hmm. I didn't become a dietitian is because, again, people not doing their homework or not being honest about what they're eating or mm-hmm. on a larger scale, you know, if I were to be go into grant writing or something like that, policy change, which I was also interested in, mm-hmm. it's just a huge mountain that I don't know how to tackle myself that, mm-hmm. and there's no funding for. It mm-hmm. and there, it's such a multifaceted issue that I was just mm-hmm. overwhelmed by it. And I said, You mm-hmm. know what? No, I'm just going to be a yoga teacher. I feel like I can have more impact mm-hmm. this way. And yoga therapy, yoga therapy. I have been training with Tiffany Cruikshank, who is yes, she's a master of uh, oriental med- medicine mm-hmm. and she's an acupuncturist. Mm-hmm. She was, I think, the acupuncturist for Nike for several years. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so she owns her business is called Yoga Medicine, mm-hmm. and Yoga Medicine. Her goal is to create teachers that can be in a directory that medical professionals can turn to and resource us Mm -hmm. when they need someone of a certain caliber of education to help. Uh So we have like a little touch of like medical knowledge, orthopedic knowledge. And I I know you took their women's health and Mm -hmm. yoga training. Um, I I took that during the pandemic as well. It was, yeah, I love her trainings that she has so many, she has so many good ones. Did you do her Mm -hmm. 300, like the full on I just have to finish it. I've done all the hours, but now I just have to do my case studies. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's one of those things that I need time for <laughs> to sit down with yeah. and finish out my soap notes. I love that sh- her trainees are so comprehensive and really go mm-hmm. into details with um, a lot of anatomy, physiology stuff. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I'm a dork for anatomy and physiology. I love it so much. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's perfect for you because you, you're you doing the PT work that you said you bring in the physical therapy and yoga therapy stuff into. So it sounds like you're, you're, you're really utilizing all the 
information you learned and got trainings in. Besides teaching public yoga, like group classes, do you have other, I know you do a lot of workshops. Um, I know you're doing some um, teacher trainings as well. Do you do any, do you do corporate or private or what are some other streams of income for you besides group, group yoga classes? Um, corporate, I have dipped my toes into during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was okay, but the people who were running it, they just didn't seem to respect my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so once they hit their second strike, I, I cut them off. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> like for the first time, I'll give you forgiveness. Second time, I'm not waiting for the third strike. Um, so I let that opportunity go. And um, I haven't really messed with much corporate. I think I would have to market myself as such. And then I might have more opportunities that way. Um, private lessons, they're, they come definitely. I probably mm-hmm. do one every month or Mm -hmm. one every couple of months. Again, this is something that I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that they Mm -hmm. could hire a yoga teacher for. So it's something that I have to like put out there, Mm -hmm. which I'm getting better at. Um, So like post pre or pre-class or post-class announcements, Mm -hmm. um, mentioning that I'm available for Mm -hmm. private training or twerk shops or Mm -hmm. uh, whatever, what have you. But yeah, that's, that's the only work I do. I considered going back to waiting tables briefly when I got to California, but I think they had sensed that I'd been self-employed for too long. And they were like, oh, we can't control her. (laughs) So (laughs) I didn't get those jobs because it would have been a step backwards. Yeah. But you've been, you've been able to make it you know like that's the thing you've been you've been able to continue teaching yoga and I feel like you're you're on the right path when things work out somehow you know and I mean we're always also putting in the work too um, well, and every once in a while someone will come out of the woodwork from like three years ago mm-hmm. and they'll say hi I took your class three <laughs> years ago and I was wondering if you would like to come up here and teach a class for mm-hmm. so- something corporate I think I did it for like a I think I did it for like a LA dance mm. company, something like that. And I got paid really well for it, uh-huh. but it just kind of had to land in my lap. I don't really know how you seek out and get these opportunities yeah. because for my experience, they just have to come to me. It's usually always word of mouth or like somebody, you know, recommends you or, you know, somebody from five years ago who remembered you from something. Um, I was talking to Karen about this too, to how finding corporate yoga gig, because a lot of them pay much better than a studio job, but doing cold calls, just sending out emails on LinkedIn, those things from my knowledge and from the people I know has never really worked. It's always mm-hmm. been, it's a referral. Somebody recommended you or you, one of your student from a group class worked for a company that needed a yoga teacher. You know, it's always kind of mm-hmm. like networking and kind of just, to continue to show show up every day and do the best you can and cultivate the relationships along the way in your journey. I feel like that's kind of how opportunity rises as a yoga teacher. Now, I would love to hear for you to kind of look back at your journey of decades of 10 year, 10 plus years of teaching. What kind of advice would you give it to someone who's starting off in this teaching career and who is interested in making it into a career, not just like people who just want to teach. Oh, I just want to teach once a week or once a month. But people who are like, I want to be a full-time yoga teacher. What kind of advice would you give for someone like that? I would tell them to look at the the skills that they already have and see like what can be paired with yoga or be complementary to yoga because it's all about community. Mm. I I think, like you said, word of mouth Mm. and, you know, building these relationships with people. Mm. Um, So looking at their, at the other skills you have for me, that was like massage therapy and physical therapy and things like that all in the body realm. Mm. But maybe you have like a really business savvy, like Mm. mind, or maybe you're really good with planning your year out ahead of time, or maybe, um, You know, if you know chiropractors, if you know doctors, if you know other people in the wellness field, it's all about like networking. And then also just like make sure that you, yeah, you set yourself up with other sources of income because it's going to be really hard. Like if you're just trying to make a living off of yoga teaching alone, um, 
teaching group classes is fun and you will, you know, start building community that way, but then you're going to need to start collecting email addresses, which is kind of scary to ask people Mm -hmm. for. So, um, Mm -hmm. workshops are a great way to Mm -hmm. expand and also collect those email addresses versus like at the end of a group class, everybody's all sweaty. Like that's Mm -hmm. not, not really a great time to do it. Um, I divert people to Instagram I would say, I would say email addresses are going to be more valuable than Instagram because Instagram is like being in a gymnasium full of people doing their circus tricks and whatever. Mm-hmm. And you're like, hey, look at me. <laughs> look at anybody want some yoga? Just trying to get some attention. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you have someone's email address, you arrive directly in their inbox. And mm-hmm. you might even like get some response back. I think there's just a more opportunity to create actual mm-hmm. relationships there and visibility. When did you start collecting your email addresses? How like how far back in your teaching career that you started collecting? It started probably when I started doing the teacher trainings, Mm -hmm. when I started marketing for that, because I was looking for people that were interested in it and I wanted to be able to contact them. Um, It took, I'm still not very good at asking for email addresses. Mm -hmm. Like I need to get more organized about how to do it. Like at the end of my workshops Mm -hmm. or maybe when people are signing in, have them Mm -hmm. give me their email. Um, I am personally, I'm a little too reliant on Instagram, even though Mm -hmm. it doesn't work so good. I do need to consistently get Mm. email addresses right now i think i have an email list of almost 400 which is not Mm. bad yeah but it could be a lot better and now i know you use offering tree and i know offering tree you can make any kind of workshop or webinar whatever and you know people have to put their email address in to register or to pay or to sign up for something so that's i find it a another good way to collect more email addresses yeah i just got on offering tree this year i was on squarespace previously oh yeah how do you like it um i like it yeah. Uh, it's very simple, but I, I haven't explored all the features either. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I learned about it from a podcast called Mastering the Business of Yoga. Yeah, MBO. Uh-huh. Yeah, MBO. Yeah, it's a good one. I've, I've been using it for my online yoga studio. And if you are, you're using Patreon still, because mm-hmm. you could p- possibly switch that to offering tree because then you don't have to be paying two platforms you can just pay one well patreon doesn't actually make you pay they just um, take a percentage okay. okay um but that's that was the idea is to yeah. transition into everything being on offering tree i'm the same way i have so many projects and like ideas and the podcast being one of them and it's like I don't have time for all these things. You know, I don't have time to in between all the classes I teach yes. or um, all the commitment it's, that I have, but I, I have a lot of ideas. Between time. I know it's the in between time that is tricky because you feel, or I feel like, oh, I should be using this time for like my creative projects and all these other things. But I also need to feed myself and like go to the grocery store and get gas and like yeah. take a nap and yeah. like all these other things that have to happen too. Exactly. And also we have to find time to do something that fuels us too. You know, like for you, maybe it's that pull dancing or like something that's not work related. That is like great outlet that we can do to whether creativity or rest or whatever it is, I think it's also important to make sure we have time for that. I'm I'm not very good at finding time for myself. It's so easy to kind of get at when you have your own business. It's so easy to like any time, extra time I have, I'm like, I should be working on my business instead of like, maybe I should rest or maybe I should go for a hike. I don't know if you find, if you find yourself in that kind of situation. Sometimes for a while, when I really struggled with organizing my time, I would uh, set up my planner and I would just have one goal for the day. I'm Mm -hmm. like, Monday, marketing. Tuesday, filming. Wednesday, website. Thursday, whatever it is, just assign Mm -hmm. one task. And then I feel like all my ideas like or excuse me if all my all the things I'm doing are serving that task then I'm happy I love that that's a great tip (laughs) is there any maybe mistakes you have made along the way during this path of yoga or yoga career that that you learned something that you want to share with the listener sure sure um the biggest mistake I made was the last time I did a teacher training by myself I learned the importance of laying out 
protocol and expectations and standards and uh, contracts and things like that before you enter into like an agreement with people because just if anything comes up later, it's in writing mm-hmm. that they agreed to it versus them saying like, oh, you never said that or uh-huh. just making sure that the expectations are all matching up. Um, I did a teacher training where I told students that if I thought that their final practicum needed work, they would have to resubmit. And so uh, that created some problems because people were like, no, I paid my money. I did my hours. I want my certificate. Mm -hmm. And so it created a little bit of drama for a bit, but Mm -hmm. we got it sorted out. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody got their certificate and Mm -hmm. I learned like, I need to put policies in Mm -hmm. place Mm -hmm. and make sure that people are aware of policies, Um, you know, cancellations, makeup work, like things like that. Yes. Whether whether that's on teacher trainings or even just like my personal training clients or my private lesson clients, like making sure that they know, for example, if you cancel less than 24 hours ahead of our appointment, you're not getting a refund because time is money. Mm -hmm. And that time that I reserved for you and now you don't want it anymore, I could have used that for something else to make money. And I think that's something people don't understand when it comes to teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. Like people see us as yoga teachers and we're just like, oh, tra-la-la, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody, Mm -hmm. we love you and Mm -hmm. we want to give you (laughs) yoga and heal the world and this and that. And they don't realize that we got to pay our bills too. Yes. Oh, so true. I I love that. And definitely with my trials and errors, I have my agreement form before I have a private client. In the beginning, there was nothing. We, I just wanted to go teach, but slowly, slowly I learned, okay, cancellation policy or like, you know, expiration day if you don't use it by this mm-hmm. time and all there's so much. Yeah. And I feel like we, we learn as we go, but it's true. If somebody told me that earlier, I wouldn't have to make the mistake that I made. So that's a great, great tip, great advice. What about what's, um, what's your, what's in the future for you? What, where, where do you want to go or where do you want to take your yoga career in the future? My desire as a yoga teacher, the reason I went down this path is because I wanted to see more of the world. In conjunction with yoga, I mm-hmm. thought that yoga would be teaching yoga would be a good vehicle to see mm-hmm. the world. Um, unfortunately, it's just been a lot of hustle for the most part and mm-hmm. struggle. So I think I would my goals for the next few years are to make more of my content online. So it frees me up to actually travel more. Mm-hmm. Um, as my as I'm getting older and my body doesn't want to teach as many studio classes, I will have to concentrate more on the educational uh, component and teaching like bigger, bigger scale workshops, I mm-hmm. think. I like that. I feel the similar way about moving my work more online so I can become more location independent. That's definitely one of my goal as well. So thank you so much, Amber. This has been amazing. Like, I feel like I learned a lot about you and getting to know you and listening to your journey of being a yoga teacher. I feel like there's a lot of part that I I, I can relate to and I understand, but also, you know, different path as well. So I love hearing your story. I think listener would really appreciate the genuine, you know, like all the struggle and hustle and also beautiful and amazing things that comes with being a full-time yoga teacher. So I really appreciate your time. Is there, can you share with the listener where they can find you, whether that's your social website, whatever it is, or any upcoming events or trainings that you want to let them know about? All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, yes, you can reach out to me. Um, on Instagram at get lit from within. That's my personal account and get lit yoga and fitness. That's my business account. I haven't paid much attention to it. So it does. It's not a lot going on there, but <laughs> it's there. You can see my website, ambercostello.com mm-hmm. and uh, you can contact me there or get lit from within at gmail.com. I also have a feminine embodiment course i mentioned it earlier it covers archetypes chakras women's health shadow work and this is a personal development course Mm -hmm. and i'll be upgrading it soon i'll be um replacing some of the videos with some nicer quality ones so the price will be increasing in a couple of months Mm -hmm. so you might want to grab it now or reach out if you have any questions Cool. Thank you. And I'll try to link as much many of the links I can get onto the um, description below. 
And thank you. Thank you, Amber, for your time. I really appreciate you taking time and it was really fun chatting with you. Awesome. Thank you, Reiko. It was my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Amber is such a strong person, strong businesswoman, and she is a go-getter. And I think I love that about her. I hope you learned something from this podcast. I hope Amber was inspiring to you. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave me a review on any platform that you're listening to. You can also write to me, send me a message on Instagram. My Instagram is Reka Yoga. What you thought about the interview, what are you thinking about the podcast? And if you have any specific questions, requests, or yoga teacher that you would like me to interview, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I will speak to you next week. Have a great day.